and literally 350. So we need to go, right? And then we'll, we'll have votes. Yeah, we, need, we should start rocking and rolling. Mm -hmm. I'd like to call the meeting uh, to order. Today's uh, hearing is a review of the FY 2016 Department of Energy budget. And I'd like to recognize myself five minutes for an opening statement. Uh, today we're going to examine the Department of Energy's proposed budget for fiscal year 2016. I'm delighted that Secretary Moniz is uh, here with us today. I'm, I want to say to him that I have great respect and admiration for him. Uh, I must also say that I don't have a lot of respect and admiration for the, the administration's energy policies. But this proposed budget for 2016 is 20 $9.9 billion, a 9% increase over last year's appropriation. Interestingly enough, many people are making the argument that while DOE's budget request is growing, the agency's role in setting the energy policy for the United States seems to be diminishing because EPA, through its regulations, seems to be dictating the energy policy more and more for America. Now, the potential damage goes well beyond the thousands of coal miners and tens of thousands of coal-fired power plant employees who have lost their jobs under this administration. Electric bills are on the rise, and reliability concerns are an increasing focus of a lot of different entities. And these are serious concerns. As a direct result, of EPA's proposed regulations on new power plants. You cannot build a state-of-the-art coal-fired plant today in America. The type that is being built today in Japan, in Germany, in China, in India, and in many other countries around the world. Now, I understand that low natural gas prices play a part. But EPA has effectively put a moratorium on construction by requiring that new plants use carbon capture technology that has not been demonstrated as commercially viable for power generation in America. And we continue to see that the prospects for CCS, power plant commercialization, are slipping years into the future, according to the Department of Energy itself. So at a time when EPA is ratcheting up the regulatory demands on coal-fired electric generation, DOE is reducing the fossil energy research and development program that could help this sector find ways to comply. Just last week, the agency stopped the FutureGen program, even though EPA's regulatory agenda continues to require that new power plants install carbon capture and storage. Now, nothing speaks better about a budget than the budget itself. And this slide illustrates precisely what I would like to say. This budget shows on the far left, that is the DOE budget for renewables and energy efficiency. And the rest of it, as you can see, all of them combined does not equal that. Now, the President of the United States goes around the country and the world talking about an all-of-the-above energy policy. But when you look at the budget of his Department of Energy, you see that his policy is about renewables and nothing else, primarily. So that's a real uh, disappointment. I might also just mention that I don't think the President's $38 million reduction in his request for funding at the Paducah gaseous diffusion site is a good uh, sign. The DOE has now awarded the deactivation contract at this site. There's a mechanism to begin s significant work, but consistent and adequate funding to begin cleanup is necessary. Overall, my issues with the proposed budget reflect my issues with the direction that this administration has taken on the energy policy, which is being climate driven. And I think the budget, this slide, certainly reflects that. And with that, uh, I would yield back the balance of my time. And I would like to recognize the gentleman from Illinois for his opening statement. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and 
I want to welcome you, Secretary Moniz. I also want to commend you for the outstanding work that you're doing uh, across the board. But I want to specifically commend you for the legacy that you're working to establish at the Department of Energy in regards to transitioning the agency to be more attuned to the needs of all segments of the diverse American population. Through the Minorities and in Energy Initiative, which celebrated its one-year anniversary back in November of last, last year, the more recent Job Strategy Council, which you established this past January, I am extremely encouraged by these policies which seek to position DOE as a proactive, forward-thinking agency that can be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Your staff, Mr. Secretary, recently got back to my office with constructive feedback on the Workforce Development Bill that I introduced in the last Congress. And I was very encouraged to see that many of the policies and programs outlined in the bill align seamlessly with the many of the proposals that you have initiated within the agency. Of course, as we both understand, the steps that have been taken are only the beginning stages of a longer process that would take time, effort, and resources to fully implement and become effective. The problem of underserved communities being historically left out of the energy sector, both in the private and public realm, did not happen overnight. And the policies needed to address these issues were not take hold overnight. The good news, Mr. Secretary, is, in, is that today there is a focus on trying to proactively promote diversity and inclusion within all sectors uh, of the industry, and there is widespread support for policies that can help accomplish this goal. On this subcommittee alone, Members of both sides of the aisle have expressed interest in moving forward with, with legislation designed to target women, minorities, veterans, and other underrepresented groups, and to help train and prepare them for the energy and manufacturing jobs of the present and of the future. Industry groups, labor unions, community colleges, and universities all understand that it is a win-win situation to help prepare a more than willing labor force for the well-paying well -paying jobs and careers that can be found in all sectors of the energy industry. In America's new energy renaissance, where a skilled workforce is mandatory from building new infrastructure, to installing wind turbines or solar panels, to designing the latest technological advances in drilling, the possibilities for the American worker are becoming more and more abundant. And ensuring that all segments of the American population are given access and equal opportunity to participate in this American energy renaissance will only serve as a benefit to industry, to communities, and to the American economy as a whole. So, Mr. Secretary, I say thumbs up to your agency, thumbs up to your plans, thumbs up to your budget. Let's get this uh, good work that the American people have called us to do. Let's start working on it immediately, if not sooner. Thank you, now you're back. Thank you, Mr. Rush. At this time, I'd like to recognize Chairman of the full committee, Mr. Upton, for five minutes. Mr. Secretary, welcome back. 
I know that today's discussion is just one of the many that DOE is uh, conducting as we look forward to working together to create a 21st century energy policy. You know, the areas of disagreement between Republicans and this administration often get the most attention. But while those differences remain, I'm one who always looks for areas of agreement, areas of common ground on an energy policy that can benefit all Americans. We've seen a tremendous increase in oil and natural gas production here in the U.S. and across North America. We're already seeing the benefits of abundant and affordable energy, whether it be at the gas pump, our power bills, and with the creation of new jobs. But for more Americans to see even better benefits, we need to move beyond decades-old energy scarcity policies. We need to maximize the benefit of North American energy, and at this committee we call it the building of the architecture of abundance. The first step is to upgrade and modernize our energy infrastructure. The new energy coming online is of no use if we can't deliver it to consumers and businesses. We need a modern and more resilient infrastructure to safely and responsibly maximize our growing oil and gas output. Our bipartisan pipeline safety legislation was an important milestone. Yes, it was, but there's more work to do. We also need to ensure that our electric grid can meet the challenges of the future. We also, uh, from everything from advanced grid technologies to protecting against weather events or physical or cyber security threats. Our energy abundance is also proving to be a powerful jobs creator, not only in places like Texas and North Dakota where production is booming, but also in Michigan and other manufacturing states where low energy prices are fueling growth and attracting new jobs. According to one study, modernizing North America's energy infrastructure could in fact support an average of 400 and 32,000 jobs per year through 2035. Despite the recent decline in oil prices, there continues to be many job opportunities for trained workers. But the key, worker, key word here is trained. One industry study estimates that there will be 600,000 career opportunities for men and women and minorities in energy in the years ahead. We need to ensure that necessary education and job training is available, is available for all Americans. Our energy potential makes us more secure here at home and more powerful abroad. We can diminish the political influence of other energy exporters like Russia and Iran and help many of our allies who would much rather buy their energy from the U.S. But it will only happen if energy security and geopolitical benefits become a part of our policy decision making. Dr. Moniz, we have a wonderful opportunity of working together to fulfill our tremendous energy potential. And I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back. At this time, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, uh, Mr. Perlone, the ranking member, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Whitfield and Ranking Member Rush. I, I just want to welcome Secretary Moniz back to the committee. This is not the easiest time to be the nation's top energy official, but I would venture to say that you're proving yourself to be one of the better secretaries we've seen. The President's fiscal year 2016 budget would fund the Department of Energy at $29.9 billion, an increase of $2.5 billion, or up 9.2 percent from fiscal year 2015 level. And the budget would increase funding for important national priorities, including energy efficiency and renewable energy. Additional policy and funding priorities which are designed to improve electric grid reliability, reduce methane pollution, and enhance U.S. economic and energy security include energy infrastructure, technology, and research to accelerate energy technologies through the development of transformational technologies. The President's budget would also fund cleaner fossil fuels as well as post- and pre-combustion carbon capture and compression technologies. And very importantly, the budget would adequately fund the Department's critical defense-related activities and add $305 million to strengthen DOE's protections and defenses against cyber attacks and improve energy sector cybersecurity. I support this budget because it takes the next logical steps in an already highly coherent energy strategy, which has graced, greatly diversified our energy sources, generated significant efficiency gains, and substantial reductions in demand, and of course lowered prices at the pump to levels that American drivers and households have not seen in many years. 
Closer to home, I want to particularly commend the work done last year and would continue under this budget with regard to the Northeast Regional Refined Product Reserve. My district in New Jersey was one of the hardest to have been hit by Superstorm Sandy, and the lack of access to gasoline made a terrible situation even worse. The gasoline reserve will help ensure we're ready in the future. In my opinion, the gasoline reserve and the department's efforts to address the resiliency and the reliability of our electric grid, natural gas transmission and distribution systems, and other energy infrastructure are critically important to not just my district, but also to the nation as a whole. In short, this budget continues to build towards a true all-of-the-above energy strategy that addresses supply, demand, and security. It builds on the progress made toward realizing the goal of creating a low-carbon, clean energy economy that can be the engine of growth for decades to come. And so I support it and I enthusiastically, and I look forward to hearing uh, more from the Secretary. I yield uh, back, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. That concludes the opening statements. And so at this time, uh, Secretary Moniz, uh, you're recognized for five minutes for your uh, statement. And welcome again. We appreciate your being here. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Chairman uh, Upton and Whitfield and ranking members uh, Pallone and, and Rush, members of the committee, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to come and discuss our, our, our budget uh, uh, with you. And I also appreciate your flexibility with regard to uh, scheduling of the, of the, uh, of the hearing. The, uh, uh, over the last uh, six years, as already been said, uh, I mean, the U.S. Uh, has become the world's uh, number one producer of, of oil, liquid fuels, natural gas, and, uh, and uh, now in in fact, our net imports of uh, of crude oil and products is below five million barrels a day. Quite a remarkable uh, place uh, to have to have come in this period. Uh, the EIA estimates that just in gasoline alone, the average household uh, will be saving $750 uh, in, in, in 2015, and there are other savings as well in the energy, in the energy sector. Uh, I have submitted a, a, an extensive uh, uh, submission for, for, the, for the record, so I'm going to be very, very brief in these remarks so that we can move to, to questions. Uh, I'll just emphasize a few points. One is this economic growth that we that we are uh, enjoying, uh, the the energy boom that we're enjoying has come, uh, even as we continue to decrease uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, uh, secondly, uh, that we are committed uh, to an all of the above uh, energy strategy, and we will continue to do that uh, through a whole raft of lower cost clean energy technologies in fossil energy, energy efficiency, sustainable transportation renewable energy, nuclear energy, uh, and, uh, well, energy efficiency I, I, I mentioned. I will also add that in addition to focusing on the supply and demand sides of the equation, uh, that we are, uh, as you know, uh, very, very much focusing on energy infrastructure, uh, and we hope to have our quadrennial energy review um, uh, available uh, within uh, weeks as opposed to months uh, of, of, of time. And of course, with your framework, uh, focusing on infrastructure, we look forward to that, to that, uh, that discussion. I'll just end with this noting, uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Pallone did, that, of course, our, uh, our role is not uh, limited to energy. Uh, one of our very important uh, roles as well uh, is in providing a good piece of the backbone for the American basic research community uh, through, our, uh, through our science, uh, science budget. Uh, the, we, uh, we have requested $5.34 billion uh, for, for science, about 5% over, uh, over the appropriation. I do want to say that uh, uh, that the science program continues to be very successful uh, in, uh, in, for example, completing large projects. I was at Brookhaven on Friday dedicating uh, a huge light source, a billion dollar project on budget and ahead of schedule. And in this budget request, we will uh, build yet additional uh, 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 facilities. Uh, in addition, uh, we have, uh, of course, a major uh, a major national defense uh, responsibility, uh, specifically uh, nuclear nuclear security, uh, and there again we have uh, I think a strong request of 11.6 billion dollars for the uh, for the National Nuclear Security Administration, uh, approximately a 10 percent increase over the FY 2015 appropriation. Very importantly, con continuing a science-based approach to the deterrent uh, and um, uh, and. Uh, helping to control uh, dangerous nuclear materials globally. Uh, 
Uh, finally, uh, environmental management, uh, our FY16 budget request uh, is for $5.8 billion, uh, approximately equal to the 2015 appropriation, although up significantly uh, from our request of, uh, of last year. It's worth noting, uh, because we clearly have some very challenging projects there, but it is worth noting that um, over the years, DOE has cleaned up over 85% of its sites and 90% of the land area, but again, significant challenges remain, and we think we can make good progress uh, in, in FY, uh, FY16. Uh, I think those really are the remarks I would just make to, to open up the discussion, because I think our, uh, our um, ability to discuss this will be much more valuable. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you very much, and uh, we appreciate uh, that opening statement. At this time, we'll begin the questions, and I'd recognize myself for five minutes. Mr. Secretary, uh, I'm not going to talk today about proposed regulations on existing coal plants, but I do want to focus for a moment on uh, the proposed regulations for the new coal power plants. And I want to do that because in December of 2010, the Department of Energy reported that it had seven potential CCS demonstration projects for coal-powered plants. Three of those plants were estimated to start up in 2014, three in 2015, and one in 2016. Now, I'm assuming that EPA and DOE had a lot of conversation with each other because, as you know, uh, EPA, in their proposed regulation for the new plants, uh, set guidelines, uh, and they focused on the Kemper plant in Mississippi, a proposed plant in Texas, one in California, and one in Canada. And the one in Texas has not began operation, has not even started construction, nor in California. There's a small one up in Canada. But the Kemper plant, of which these emission standards were developed, looking at the pro uh, projected emissions from Kemper, this is a plant that's two years behind schedule, billions of dollars over budget. And of those projects that DOE talked about in 2010, three of those projects have been canceled. Three of the remaining four projects that are now estimated to begin operation in 2019 or 2020, if at all. And yet EPA sets a standard, an emission standard, based on projected emissions from some pie-in-the-sky CCS plant that's built so that you can use CCS for enhanced oil recovery. And this morning, I had a meeting with the Applied uh, Energy Vice President of the University of Kentucky, who just come back from China, where they are tearing down old coal plants but building new coal plants using supercritical technology, uh, like the one at the uh, Turk plant over in Texarkana, Arkansas, which is the newest plant in, in the U.S., which was built before this proposed regulation comes out. So here we are in America, finding ourselves not able to build a new plant using the best technology because of some fathomable emission standard set by EPA. And I was just curious, has EPA... Uh, you, Ms. McCarthy or others, have they talked to you all about this and the state of commercially v viable CCS technology? Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, so first, first of all, uh, as with lots of lots of rules across the government uh, activities, the Department of Energy does often provide you know, technical support when it's done our responsibility uh, to do to um, to implement a certain a certain rule or. Regulation. The um, with regard to carbon capture and sequestration, uh, I think it's very important to uh, keep in perspective uh, the proposed rule uh, and what our demonstration projects are, because they are different levels of ambition uh, in a certain sense. First of all, there's no question that all of the uh, technologies uh, uh, have been have been demonstrated, uh, including in an integrated fashion, for example, in the Boundary Dam project in, in Canada to which to which you referred, uh, and uh, uh, and for both coal plants and for industrial plants, there are other other large projects coming on coming on board. But I think a very important point is 
we are, as is appropriate for the Department of Energy, our projects are really trying to push the edge. So uh, all of our projects are looking at, you know, 90 percent capture, et cetera. If you look at the rule as proposed, uh, for example, building an ultra supercritical uh, coal plant with carbon capture, uh, with that proposed rule, would require only 30 percent capture. Uh, that's a very, very different uh, uh, level of challenge uh, than, than, the, than the projects that we are, we are putting together. We, we will be seeing, it's, uh, you are absolutely right that some of the projects are delayed. We will be seeing a good portfolio deployed, uh, but you're, you're also correct that some of the projects uh, uh, will not uh, come online, uh, and uh, partly it's because of litigation and other issues uh, and the ARA funding deadline uh, uh, coming, coming in this year. But again, the key point is, uh, uh, if one were to go out right now to build an ultra supercritical plant, and they exist, uh, uh, and use conventional capture there, one's talking only about 30 percent. Well, I might just say that the uh, experts in the utility industry say that it could not be done in a commercially viable way where they can be competitive. And I think the EPA, in this extreme uh, regard of this regulation is uh, really diminishing our opportunity to be competitive and have a reliable electricity source. At this time, I'd like to if recognize that. I'd be happy to come by and talk about some of this in, in more specific detail in terms of yeah. especially the ultra supercritical route. Yeah, we'll, we'll take you up on that. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, for five minutes. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, I've got a lot of questions that I want to cover. But unfortunately, I don't have the time to do it all this afternoon, so I will be reaching out to your office to schedule a meeting where we can more fully discuss some of the priorities that I have already outlined. That said, Mr. Secretary, my office is contacted frequently by business owners and entrepreneurs who would like to access DOE loans, grants, and or energy technology transfers from the national labs. Many of these entrepreneurs feel as if they cannot access these resources either because they don't know the right people, don't have the right connections, they don't fully understand the process, or in some cases they might, not, might just be intimidated by the very same process. Mr. Secretary, in addition to helping women, minorities, veterans, and other underrepresented groups access employment in the private sector through outreach and skills training, I would also like to work with you to uh, establish outreach policies to educate the public on accessing DOE loans, grants, and technological transfers. It is important that we demystify these processes so that all Americans can benefit from these extraordinary resources that DOE possesses. Do you agree? And do you have any preliminary thoughts on how we might educate the public to make these resources, these loans, grants, tech transfers more accessible? Thank you, uh, Mr. Rush, um, uh, and thank you again for your support of the Minorities and Energy uh, Program, uh, including being there at the beginning uh, uh, and the one-year anniversary. Uh, in terms of uh, the access um, uh, to the labs and the transparency, um, uh, that, is, that is a very important issue. We are working on that. Uh, actually, we can provide you um, some background material, also, for example, on some of the websites uh, that we have created, for example, looking at financing opportunities uh, for, uh, for, for business. Um, uh, uh, but we have we have more to go, uh, more uh, a longer way to go. Just today, uh, the, literally this morning, uh, we were able to announce the a new uh, a new uh, group that we are putting together, a new office. It's called the Office of Technology Transitions, uh, and uh, that office's uh, uh, role is precisely to address the transparency and access uh, to technologies that are in our laboratories that we want to get out as well uh, uh, and have, have a, larger, a larger custom base for it, if you like. Importantly, and I do want to note this very clearly, uh, in the 2005 
Energy Policy Act, uh, the Congress uh, authorized a 0.9 percent of applied energy R&D fund for commercialization. Uh, up to now, uh, that has been satisfied uh, by the existing cost-shared CRADA agreements. Uh, today, uh, I announced that uh, we are going to move forward and actually create that as a separate fund a technology commercialization fund that will be uh, run out of this Office of Technology Transitions uh, by our technology transfer coordinator. Uh, it will seek at least 50% matching funds. Uh, we can always be waived in, in special circumstances, but that would be the norm. Uh, and uh, making that system transparent, uh, allowing access to uh, medium and small business as well as large businesses will be part of the goal. Mr. Secretary, I, 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 you've done such a remarkable job uh, during your tenure uh, in establishing the Minorities and Energy Initiative and the Job Strategy Council. I, I don't know, do you think that we, have, we should look at some of your best practices and begin to codify some of those uh, in law? Um, that's the first question. And the second question, if you have an opportunity to answer this, is that do you think that uh, this $29.9 billion budget that you're seeking, is that enough to do the work that you're required to do in this particular area? Uh, well, I, th I think the I think the budget request is a, is a is a is a very good one and one one in which we can move forward uh, in the areas that you have said. But it will I mean it will take frankly, continued commitment uh, at the at the top of the department. And then I don't mean only me. I mean uh, a lot of other of the, of the leadership of, of, of the department. And as far as best practices go, uh, there were several to draw upon. One, we, we mentioned earlier the, uh, the tremendous development in the oil and gas sector, for example, in the United States. And here I'll say we're working together with uh, API, uh, the Petroleum Institute. Uh, it's been terrific in that we've had, uh, I think now about a half a dozen workshops jointly focusing on attracting uh, minorities into the many job opportunities uh, in, in that area. That's one example. Uh, another, another example, uh, a person we brought on board last uh, last uh, June uh, named Dave, Dave Foster uh, is really the point person on the whole job strategy. Uh, and so combining minorities in energy, women in clean energy, job strategy, the situation on, in, our, in our energy world right now, the very, the very fortunate one, uh, I, I hope we can make some real progress in the next two years. We need the talent. The gentleman's time has expired. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Upton, for five minutes. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on Monday, as you know, Mr. Secretary, the, the, this committee released a legislative framework for compiling a solutions-based energy package uh, in this Congress, and it consisted really of four areas. Modernizing infrastructure, 21st century energy workforce, energy diplomacy, and efficiency and accountability. And we do want to uh, make sure that we coordinate this closely with our Senate counterparts and also working with the Department of Energy, and we welcome the constructive engagement in, in those areas and appreciate the discussions we've had uh, thus far. Also know that uh, we have had, uh, that the department is preparing for the release of the first quadrennial energy review, QER, focusing on energy transmission, storage, and distribution, and we further understand that the effort will include some legislative proposals to Congress which should complement the effort underway before this committee. And while we've not yet received your recommendations, we look forward to working with you, reviewing those uh, in a timely manner to find agreement in, of common interest. And I appreciate uh, that willingness. Uh, recognizing that the legislative process is about give and take, we hope that you'll be able to be open to our ideas as we see seek solutions to permitting challenges uh, and infrastructure uh, bottlenecks to resolve those. We also think that it's important to think about ways how we can use our energy resources and the department's role in securing resource development as a source for global good. And I know that you have been personally involved in a whole, for many, many months, of discussions with our allies in Eastern Europe and, and around the world, our partners in uh, Canada and, and, the, and Mexico, and I wonder if you might expound on those in the remaining time that I have. 
some of those. Certainly, thank you. And uh, and first of all, let me again assure you uh, publicly of uh, what we've discussed uh, privately that uh, we look forward to working on the on the framework uh, that you've put forward. All of those issues uh, are very dear to what we are doing, especially the accountability of Congress uh, is that, was <laughs> in that fourth part. You don't have to worry about <laughs> us. Right? The uh, um, with regard to the international uh, events, uh, I'll mention two of those. Yes, um, one is uh, Ukraine. You effectively alluded to, and um, uh, our uh, people, uh, led by our emergency response people, but bringing in uh, others, Red Cross, uh, FEMA, uh, uh, Canadians have been very helpful. Uh, we have uh, sent the teams over to Ukraine uh, now three times. Uh, our teams, I want to emphasize, did not write the winter contingency plan, energy win contingency plan for, the, for Ukrainians, but led them through the process of how to do that, and they wrote an energy contingency plan. Uh, uh, there, it also identified correctly the problem that there was going to be with coal, for example, this 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 winter, um, and some other problems. Uh, so that's gone. Uh, it, that's been very 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 well appreciated. The Ukrainian government is asking us now to do more. Uh, which uh, we had a fact-finding group go there a week before last. Uh, they would like training. They would like uh, they would like to know uh, how to manage emergency response. They would know they want to know about energy modeling. These are all, I think, very helpful tools for them. But that's where I think we will need some discussion uh, with the Congress and other parts of the administration as to how uh, how we can respond to that. We go out to North America. Uh, in December, we had a very, very, uh, very positive uh, trilateral energy ministerial with uh, Canada and Mexico. Uh, uh, one result is we agreed that we should do it every year, <laughs> at least, which is progress. Uh, but, for example, we signed an MOU uh, that uh, we've already launched the work on uh, through, uh, through our Energy Information Administration on data, energy data integration. We really don't have a lot of data integration across the borders, or in some cases, the same data. <laughs> it seems to be uh, it seems to be different. So that's just one example. I'll mention a, a very interesting example. Uh, in the trilateral, uh, our Mexican colleagues, um, uh, Minister Joaquin Coldwell in particular, gave us an extensive briefing on energy reform in Mexico. And while there's been a lot of focus on the hydrocarbon part, I want to emphasize the reform on the electricity sector is equally ambitious and will open up many more collaborative possibilities. In fact, they said electric more electricity integration is something that uh, Mexico would like to work, work with us very, very closely. So I think th those are two areas of, of some of our international work, different in, different in character, but both very important. Great. Thank you. Yield back. Gentleman yields back. This time, recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Secretary, for coming in. It's always a pleasure to have you testify in front of the committee here. Thank you. Um, uh, I, as I look over the, the budget numbers, I'm very happy to see a large increase in the energy delivery and energy reliability categories. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, Ms. Elmers, and I are working together on, on uh, grid technology. Um, and I just want to uh, ask uh, what the department can do to translate all that is learned about smart grid investment grants and smart grid uh, demonstration projects into actionable information uh, for electricity, electricity providers. Thank you. The, uh, I can assure you also the Quadrennial Energy Review uh, coming out will have a major focus, of course, on the electricity uh, grid, uh, as does our budget. Uh, we have a $356 million um, uh, proposal for uh, the whole grid modernization approach. So uh, that will have many, many aspects. Part of it will be developing more of the essential technologies, uh, like the high-power electronics, uh, wide, ba wide band gap semiconductors, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, part of it will be a system analysis. Um, part of it um, will be further integration. You alluded to the data. So, for example, with the ARA funding, one of the major uh, one of the major programs was to really deploy uh, well over a hundred synchro phasers uh, to really let us know what's going on in the high in the high voltage uh, grid. Now, integrating that information into 
actionable uh, 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 precautionary uh, 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 actions uh, would be will be will be part of this. But also another part of it is uh, actually we have two different programs, uh, but one specifically here is we also propose a state planning grant program. Uh, it's about $27 million we propose for grants to states to plan for reliability and how they will be doing integration. That, of course, in turn could lead to subsequent uh, proposals for actual projects to implement you know, microgrids, distributed generation, other kinds of uh, IT-based uh, technologies. Well, good. I'm looking forward to working with your department on, on that uh, and with my colleagues. Um, Fusion. What have you done? What do we have in the next budget for fusion uh, energy? And you know, this is an area I think I, I, I a, lot, a lot of good uh, future potential, but right, it's it's right. not in the immediate yeah. future. I, I regret I had the same answer as last year, <laughs> uh, which is that I am recused uh, from uh, from fusion. Um, uh, that recusal ends in May. So if you'd like to ask me the question in June, <laughs> we could come back. Um, the uh, but but seriously, then I, I mean, perhaps our deputy secretary or our undersecretary could come and visit you about that because yeah. I, I I am recused from all the decision-making uh, in, in the fusion program. Okay, fair enough. Um, uh, so about the smart grid technologies, uh, what do you think some of the barriers are to um, improving our grid technology and reliability then, given the, given what, where we are today? Well, I think the uh, uh, one, one of the, on, on the high voltage side, the high voltage grid, um, I think uh, one of the issues is I already described was this issue of now being able to use the new data that we are getting right. from these new kinds of sensors. But a lot of the action is really going to be on the distribution side. Uh, I think that's where a lot of the uh, embedded intelligence has to be. Uh, that's key to starting to bring in distributed generation, uh, maybe distributed storage. So you think uh, we're going to have to put uh, incentives out there for the local distribution networks to, to move forward? So, and so that's a very good point, which I was going to end with. Of course, we can help on the technology side, uh, but the regulatory authority for that, of course, will, will rest with the states. So that's where we need state, uh, potential state federal partnership. That's where those planning grants can come, can come in, where we'll give a grant to states, to the state energy offices, uh, to see what they need to do for their smart grid, and then we'll see if there's some possibility of our working with them to implement it. Good. Well, I'm also uh, happy to see uh, energy efficiency and renewable energies move forward uh, with this budget. Very important for our nation's uh, uh, energy mix to have those as, as a significant, reliable Thank part. Um, I just want to uh, ask the chairman to consider that developing carbon sequestration technology is going to be beneficial to the coal industry. Uh, because as uh, climate change progresses, there's going to be a larger outcry to stop uh, producing carbon dioxide. So this is something that is going to benefit the coal industry. We're not out to hurt the coal industry with carbon sequestration. Thank I'll you. yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. This time right now is the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, welcome. Um, Thank you. Which DOE, are these the DOE labs that have high-level nuclear waste? Oak Ridge? Savannah River, Idaho Labs, and Hanford, are there any more? Um, in, in significant amounts. Was, in significant amounts. I think those, those are the main ones. Actually, and, and principally, uh, Idaho, uh, ha um, Hanford, okay. and Savannah River, yeah. Uh, While well, I was at Oak Ridge, they uh, Oak Ridge, also, concern, also, Oak Ridge yeah. also has, yes. Um, you have promised me numerous times that, that you, as a secretary, would continue to follow that law. That's the law of the land. Is that still true? Always has been true. <laughs> Great. Okay. Good. We're going. To, we're in the right track here. So, in your budget and the Constitution, right? <laughs> in your budget justification, you have three billion dollars to uh, move to a pilot interim storage plan. You agree that that would have require a change in law? Do you not? Uh, certainly not to to begin uh, to begin to discuss uh, consent based processes, etc. Uh, we but the Nuclear Waste Policy Act is uh, the law. Signed. No, so, so, so we, we. So the use of this money would not be with the intent of the law, because the law says that uh, it doesn't give the DOE the authority or the responsibility to go into a 
pilot interim storage. To site to site such a facility uh, would require further legislation. Thank you. Uh, I would note, of course. Uh, well, let me just go on. Okay. Um, uh, so you have three billion. You also mentioned five point seven billion is outlined to uh, to maybe do this, of course, which would require a change in law. Um, but the um, and I made this point, I think, last year. There is, and the administration needs to appreciate that there is a, a change occurring in the state of Nevada. Uh, we had recently had one, um, a member elected who said that having, if it was proven that uh, Yucca Mountain would be safe, then he would support it. That's public record. So uh, uh, now that the NRC has finished its safety and valuation report, it said that uh, yucca once closed would be safe for a million years. So we uh, w we are in a new world now than we were before, and uh, just for a, a public record, um, three billion or five point seven billion could be very helpful in the state of Nevada transitioning to um, um, restarting and opening Yucca Mountain and also uh, a um, an interim uh, pilot interim storage site. So I, I just put that on on the record. The um, We've also heard that uh, it, it, it is also required by DOE under the law to do the uh, environmental impact statement. Isn't that not correct? Uh, we we have uh, the answer is yes. We have responded. <laughs> we have responded to every request and order from the NRC, uh, including the, providing the information that they needed for the ground. But you're not doing it. We have we have we have no. It's your it's your responsibility on the law to do the environmental impact statement. And what's going on now is the NRC is going to do it with the money remaining because of, of the failure of DOE to to do the final EIS. No, we have responded completely to NRC's request. Okay, we'll just um, we'll just agree to disagree. Um, as the NRC moves forward with adjudication of the license application, assuming that the funds are made available for the purpose, will you commit to following the law and defending the application DOE has submitted? I, I must point out that the NRC also pointed out that uh, we do not have the authorities in terms of land and water for example, for Yucca Mountain, which goes right back to the consent-based process. Without a consent-based process, uh, the uh, we continue to but, think that. But the work. question is, under the law, uh, you are required to defend the application. Uh, are you willing to follow the law and defend the I, I will have to check with the, ex the exact aspects of, of the law on that. I know the DOE was required to submit the application. Okay, last time we tried to visit Yucca, DOE gave us a lot of trouble. Um, we're going back this year. I hope you'll give us all um, uh, opportunity and, and not cause, uh, and make it easy for us to get there and I, get sorry, the door open. I, I, I wasn't aware of that. I apologize for that. No, no, no. I'll look for oh, that. okay. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, and then finally, um, yeah, the, um, in your budget, Future Gen 2.0, uh, obviously that money was pulled. The, that was the retrofitting of the plant in Meridosha and then the ca carbon capture sequestration issue in Morgan County, Illinois. Um, it's just, I just make that point obviously because it's Illinois and that's a traditional DOE project from the original future gen to now future gen 2.0 to pulling it away. It just adds to what uh, those of us from coal areas of the country uh, are concerned that uh, as we ramp up these environmental rules and regulations, we really shut down coal-fired generation, and that's major baseload activity, which we, as a country, uh, you know, just can't sustain the loss of that power. So with that, thank you, and I look forward to working with you. Mr. Chairman, may I just comment? Yes. Make, make two comments, if I, if I may. I think it be, might be helpful. Uh, one is, first of all, in your opening uh, statement, Mr. Shimkus, in terms of uh, the four DOE sites, I would just note, of course, those do not have commercial spent fuel. It's high-level waste, and uh, <laughs> which doesn't make any sa any less safe. And it's supposed to. Where is that no, no, supposed no, to go? Sir, where sir, is it supposed to go? But so, if I may just say that uh, th there's no no resolution yet, but but uh, last well, fall, no, there is a resolution. It's supposed to go to Yucca Mountain. No, last fall, <laughs> that's where it's supposed to go. Last fall. <laughs> We completed a study, and it's on our, on our website, uh, requested by the Blue Ribbon Commission, uh, in terms of looking at the issue of whether there should be separate pathways. That, that remains a decision to be, to be reached. Uh, with regard to future gen, uh, let me just say that uh, 
uh, I think the future gen project, uh, an oxy combustion plant uh, with a deep saline aquifer uh, uh, storage is very, very important. Uh, and um, uh, unfortunately, uh, the, that funding was from the Recovery Act. The date of expending the funds is upon us, so the project yeah. could not meet that. And with regret, we are we are in the the structured uh, uh, closeout. I do want to say we will preserve the IP and we will preserve the asset of the poor space uh, that we have we have purchased uh, in, in in Illinois. Thank you. I'll just say that the Blue Ribbon <laughs> Commission is not an elected body, and they were refused. They were they were told specifically not to consider Yucca Mountain. Mm -hmm. This time I recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Capps, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And it's always a pleasure, Mr. Secretary, to have you come you. before our committee. And uh, today was no different. Um, and I want to start with a premise, which I hope is we can all agree upon, and that is the fact that climate change is real and it is a serious threat to our nation and to our planet. While we're already seeing and paying for the impacts of climate change, we do still have a chance to mitigate some of the very of the long-term damages. We need to act now, however, to reduce carbon pollution and move toward a clean, sustainable energy future. This will require significant American innovation and investment. And I know the Department of Energy and this administration is committed to it. While this is not easy, I believe we have some of the best innovation and innovators uh, in the world and that we are up to that challenge. But they cannot do it on their own. The federal government does play an essential role in driving the research and uh, in development of these technologies. And this is something I've seen firsthand in my district. Uh, and I want to ask you about two of the projects that uh, come out of your administration uh, that are uh, being developed uh, through the University of California in Santa Barbara, have applications there. Uh, and uh, this uh, one of them is the that was one of the first uh, frontier uh, energy research centers designated by the depart your department in 2009. And since then, this center has made very significant advances in key energy technology, some of which we use every day, like photovoltaics and LEDs. In your testimony, you say that the Energy Research Center's program is DOE's flagship, this is a quote, flagship investment in basic science that underpins future energy technologies. Music to my ears. Mm -hmm. Why is this program so important to DOE's efforts on climate change, and do you see this commitment remaining strong in the future? Thank you. Um, uh, the, yes, the EFRCs, um, um, I, I think, have been a tremendous success. Um, I might say for the committee that originally they were 46 funded uh, in uh, 2009, um, uh, uh, partly with Recovery Act funds. But it's worth saying, uh, this again, in, in a bipartisan spirit, yep. that the, the setup for the e EFRCs uh, came from an exemplary uh, process uh, run by the Department of Energy uh, during the Bush administration, several years of convening workshops of 1,500 scientists to define the key science challenges uh, that underpin future energy technologies. They've been tremendously success successful. With the era of funding fall off, regrettably, we've had to lower the total number. But in FY16, we are proposing a 10% increase to be able to get uh, a, a few more of those operating. They have been tremendously successful and I think are very important for the future of, of clean energy in this country. And that leads me right into my second question. Because now, uh, while some marketplace applications are already there, it's so essential that these come out of the lab setting out of the research institutions and get into our economy and be help to build that economy in the right direction. But, and that's why I was so pleased to see the increase in your budget. Um, uh, ARPA-E provides essential research and development funding from the government, but it, the part that we need to stress even more is the generation of private funds that are, that are going to be, a, that have already and will be continue to drive our economy. Will you elaborate on this? What's the ratio between, like the, I call it startup funds that, that come from the federal government, and how does that impact uh, the private sector? Because that's what motivates me when I see it uh, becoming an economic driver right in my congressional district. 
The, um, uh, first of all, the RPE program is another example of, I think, of a tremendously successful uh, program, and we have requested an increase from uh, 280 to $325 million. Uh, by the way, the RPE Summit is going on as we speak uh, uh, out of the convention center, uh, and I was there this morning, and it's just remarkable technologies. And I'd like to say here that we are, have some first discussions going on about potentially bringing um, to the to the Congress uh, an exhibit of some of the RPE uh, techno technologies. I think it would be a great science fair for us to uh, for us to have here. In terms of the the impact, uh, the the fifth anniversary of the first RPE contract will be coming up in March. So now that we're at the five year mark, what we are seeing is a lot of these projects getting into the marketplace. Uh, big leverage in terms of in terms of investment. Um, uh, I know one class of projects just drew in eight hundred million dollars of, 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 of financing, but also five of the projects now have been essentially bought by much larger strategic investors. Uh, you know, a big, for example, a big American defense firm, firm uh, just took, took that. So these are becoming into the marketplace five years. Uh, it's, that's a pretty good track record. Wow. Well, Chair, I'm, I'm going to yield back, but I think that was a very uh, practical suggestion. It would be interesting to work with the Science Committee to see if there could be some kind of demonstration here yeah. uh, on, on Capitol Hill. Yeah. For, for what we, we, we had a... I'm sorry if I may just, we had uh, last fall a, I thought a very successful, I, I mean some of you I think may have come, very successful lab day where we showed uh, results out of the laboratories and I think now it would be nice to complement that with an RPE day. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And um, at this time I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Olson, for five minutes. I thank the chair and welcome Dr. Moniz. <laughs> I want to start with a few thank yous, my friend. Thank you for going to India this past March and making exports of U.S. LNG a top priority between India and America. Sure. Thank you for that. Very important back home. Also, thank you for the role your department played in the Petronova project in the Parish Power Plant in my district, the first true carbon capture enhanced oil recovery operation in America that will be viable. Thank and you under for that. And under construction. <laughs> yes, sir. Right. My first question is about our national security infrastructure has been under attack. Last April, snipers shot up Silicon Valley substation, a substation there. In 19 minutes, they fired off rounds, almost causing a blackout in Silicon Valley. 23 pipeline companies have had cyber attacks. Your 2016 budget doesn't address these attacks. You spend six times more on solar than secure power lines and secure pipelines. And I'm sorry to put you on the clock, but in one minute, can you tell us your views on duty's role on protecting our energy infrastructure? What's your role? Yes, uh, 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 there's several things to say about that. It's a very important problem. Uh, and I, for number one, the Quadrennial Energy Review first installment uh, on infrastructure uh, uh, will have a significant focus on resilience against multiple threats, uh, extreme weather, uh, cyber, physical, geomagnetic storms, which actually have occasionally uh, hit, uh, hit, hit the system. Um, that's one point. Second point is the, um, uh, first of all, I want to thank the, the Congress uh, in, the, in, the, in the fiscal year 15 budget. Uh, there was uh, funding included for us to build out our uh, emergency response center for, for the energy system so that we will have better situational awareness about threats to our, uh, to our, to our system. We will be implementing that uh, this year. Third, uh, we have a substantial cybersecurity crosscut in the budget. Uh, fourth, uh, we convened under, under the Deputy Secretary, uh, it's been going on now for a few years, a very high level, a CEO level uh, elect electric utility group uh, specifically on cybersecurity, uh, and including the fact that we have granted uh, security clearances to a select number of leaders so that we can go deeper into the threats, threat space. Well, thank you, and thank you. That was one minute exactly. 
My next question is about EPA working with you and FERC. EPA's regulations are closing many baseload power plants, mostly coal plants. And those that stay open may have to go offline at times for retrofits. Our grid will look very different in 2020. And there could be local brownouts, local blackouts. Some have complained that EPA is seeking advice on the impact of its rules after the fact and in a very ad hoc way. My question, sir, is do you object to creating a process where EPA consults with FERC and DOE as new air rules are written? Yes or no? Well, the answer is yes in the sense that it happens. Uh, we, we, we provide technical, uh, technical assistance, uh, and that's with both EPA and FERC. How about we create a formal process of review with the APA, FERC, and you? Object that, because right now that doesn't exist. It's sort of informal. How about a formal process of review? So well, I, I think I ha we, ha we have to review specifics, but I think, uh, I think it happens now in the sense that certainly, certainly any rule that goes through uh, OIRA and then, and then uh, goes out for agency comment, in addition to our direct technical consultation uh, there. So, uh, so I think I'd have to look at terms of what, what enhancement would be being, being looked at. But I'm, I'm certainly happy to have that discussion. Okay, thank you. One final question about a bill I've had last, bill I've had last Congress. It's a bipartisan bill with myself, Mr. Green, and Mr. Doyle. It guarantees that if a power plant is ordered to briefly run and exceed its permits during an emergency situation, that under Section 202C of the Federal Power Act, other regulators can interfere and shut them down. Your predecessor, Mr. Chu, said, good bill. He supports it. I asked you last time you were here, you just got here, you hadn't looked at, so you've had some time. Support the bill? Uh, I'm going to have to look at the bill, but this is about uh, engaging Our crisis engaging service. Federal, Federal Power Act Yeah, we have to find some bearing tax, well, across the country where there's been a power crisis. There's been a heat wave, a cold snap. There's been a transport order to stay online, exceed their emission permits. They've been sued. This bill stops that. This says if there's a true crisis, you can exceed your permits for 60 days and review it. Again, common sense, keep the power up, keep people cold in the summer and hot in the winter. Do you support that concept of having one voice, the power regulator, decide what will run, what won't run? Well, again, I, I think we'll have to follow this up, uh, but certainly the DOE has Federal Power Act authorities to uh, order plants to run, at least for some period of time, uh, to make sure reliability is there. You know, in a crisis, it's obviously something you don't want to use a lot. Uh, frankly, it was used... <laughs> The last time I was here, uh, at the end of the 90s in California, uh, Secretary Richardson uh, had to order some plants to, uh, to, to run uh, to, avoid, uh, to avoid blackouts. Uh, that's fine, but they've been sued. The power generator said, keep that plant up and running. They were sued. Mira in San Francisco got sued for doing what the regulars said to do. That's what this bill tries to stop. Let them keep the power up without penalty. We will, I will, we will, we will, we will look at this and get back to you. Gentlemen's time has expired. This time I recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, welcome. It's always a pleasure to have you here in front of the committee. Uh, Mr. Secretary, as you know, I have a keen interest in the National Energy Technology Lab for many reasons, but uh, most especially because of the outstanding work that Nettle's doing in implementing the mission of DOE's Office of Fossil Energy. Uh, the work of the Nettle is critical to people of southwestern Pennsylvania, uh, as well as many other states in our entire nation. Uh, recently, uh, a, a commission has been created. It's currently working to examine missions and effectiveness of DOE national labs, including the NETL. And in fact, the commission is in Pittsburgh today uh, as we speak, preparing to make recommendations, including privatizing the lab, which I think would be a huge mistake and, and unacceptable. Uh, can you share with us your perspective on the efficacy of the NETL and what you see as the future for our national labs? Are there specific areas of concern that you have or have been brought to your attention? Um, and I would like to say that I know we've had you in Pittsburgh several times, and, and we certainly appreciate it, uh, but your schedule hasn't permitted you to actually visit the NETL in Pittsburgh. Right. Uh, and I would like to... Uh, 
contact your office and reach out to you and see if we might be able to schedule a visit okay. uh, to the lab yeah. in Pittsburgh. But yeah. Could you talk a little bit about mm -hmm. this commission and any yeah. concerns you may okay. have? I mean, I've been to the Morgantown site, but uh, and yeah, I, well, and, no, and I have, I think, a, yeah. I think I have another scheduled in Pittsburgh. I'm, so I'm sure the we'll gentleman from West Virginia appreciates that. That's right. That doesn't oh, right. He was there. He Pittsburgh. was there. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So that's right. Yeah. Uh, the uh, I mean, West Virginia is okay. so friendly to the administration. I can understand why you're there <laughs> first and not in not in <laughs> Pittsburgh. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, NETL. Uh, uh, look, NETL is our fossil fuel lead laboratory. Uh, just no, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Uh, and um, and has done uh, very, very good work in in the carbon capture sequestration arena, in methane hydrates, and uh, uh, in uh, uh, some of the hydraulic fracturing, uh, environmental impact work, et cetera, et cetera. So um, its future is. Uh, we have a new director, of course, a relatively new director. Uh, and I think she is doing. Uh, she she will do a great job. Uh, I think. Uh, the um, uh, first of all, you mentioned privatize, and I I I don't know what this commission, this congressional commission, will recommend. But uh, certainly, we have. Let me make very very clear. We have no plans to change the organizational structure of NETL uh, as uh, the one of our 17 laboratories that right. is a that is a federal uh, federal organization. I, I appreciate uh, you hearing you say that. Can you tell me, uh, we know NETL has been playing a role in, in identifying and developing and deploying numerous technologies that increase efficiencies and reduce any environmental concerns from coal-fired plants, which is a, a big source of our electricity uh, in states like Pennsylvania and, and others. Uh, right. But, you know, if we're going to be serious about moving fossil energy research and development forward, I do have some concerns about the proposed DOE budget in 2016 for fossil energy. It seems to me that we need to establish scale demonstrations of technologies to, to show our industry partners and the nation uh, that we have a serious commitment to this, uh, specifically in areas of ad advanced combustion systems, gasification, advanced turbines, coal biomass to liquids, fuel cells, and rare earth elements research. And much of this research, I should note, uh, is being done at, in Pittsburgh at the NETL. I'd really like to hear about your commitment to fossil energy R&D and, and where you see the role uh, of this in America's energy portfolio, and, and also to talk a little bit about the current status of DOE's CCS research development and demonstration efforts and what your agency is doing to develop a sustainable future for coal. Okay, there's many parts to that question. Um, uh, first of all, uh, in terms of the commitment to um, advancing uh, clean fossil fuel technology, clean coal uh, technologies. Uh, again, we, I, I think we are demonstrably very committed. Uh, we are, we had discussion earlier on the large integrated CCS projects, uh, and I anticipate a good five of those will uh, be, be fully successful uh, in operating. Uh, we have right now open uh, an $8 billion loan guarantee program uh, in Fossil, and I can't talk about individual projects, but we are pretty happy with the proposal stream. I might note this is not DOE, but in the FY16 budget, there is the proposal for new uh, tax credits, uh, uh, investment tax credits for, uh, for CCS, uh, and a, a tax credit for sequestering uh, CO2. Uh, so that's very strong. Then, in, then of course, we have our, our R&D program uh, in terms of, oh, which is in fossil energy and also in RPE. We shouldn't forget RPE mm -hmm. also uh, has uh, uh, programs on methane detection, carbon capture, et cetera. So uh, it's a very, very broad uh, program. You mentioned also rare earths. Um, that's the study that the Congress asked for, uh, I believe, is within a two or three months probably uh, about uh, addressing the questions about whether or not uh, coal ash, et cetera, is a, a viable source of rare earths. And I don't know the answer. If, it, if the answer is yes, then we should discuss how to, how to implement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to following up with you on the Pittsburgh visit. Right. This time I recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Lada, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Secretary, for being with us today. Appreciate your testimony. And if I could uh, talk a little and ask a few questions about um, the uh, American Medical Isotopes Reduction Act of uh, 2012. 
And as part of that, the uh, Department of Energy is to develop a program to assist in the establishment of domestic production capabilities for medically vital isotopes like uh, MO99, or I think it's also pronounced MOLLE99. And that is used in nuclear medicine to perform life-saving procedures related to both heart disease and staging of cancer, two of the largest killers in our country. And the motivation of the law was to address the fact that uh, foreign production facilities that are scheduled to cease production in 2016, and in the Western Hemisphere, the only place that there is producing it is in Canada, and I believe that they're going to be going out if, unless something changes, I think, in 2016 when that occurs. And then uh, if you look around the world where there might be production in uh, Europe, uh, I think there's uh, five different facilities and one in Russia. I think there's uh, one, or, one in, uh, or two in South Africa and also in Australia. But also uh, what this produces has a shelf life of only about 66 hours. So to get it from point A to point B to this country, is vital to make sure that it's not degrading during that period of time that it's only 50 percent effective when it gets here. So I guess the first question is uh, when the supplier in Canada ceases its isotope production in 2016, what is the DOE doing to ensure that there isn't a shortage that would affect, I think, the United States using probably 50 percent of the world's isotope? Well, as we continue to develop uh, capabilities, uh, one, one of the important uh, developments um, in the last week was that Canada announced uh, that it will uh, maintain the capability until 2018 uh, if uh, if required. So they they made that announcement and and uh, and uh, without getting into too many specifics, we work we would work with them to see that that 2018 uh, date can be met. And in the 2018 time frame, then I think we are much more assured of, of, of continuous, uh, continued. Well, let me ask this, uh, okay, if, if we go from 16 to 18, but at the same time, is, you know, is there the thought that the United States ought to be manufacturing it right here in the United States? And if that's the case, how long would it take from start to finish to be able to produce a facility that could produce that uh, isotope? Um, so I, I won't have to get back to that in terms of the exact timeline. I just don't have that at, okay. at, on my fingertips, I'm afraid. But we, we will get back to you on that. Because at the same time, you know, if you could also get back on the whole question, on really, if it's going to be longer than uh, 2018, is there a way that this could be expedited to make sure that we don't yeah. have that shortage in the United States then? But yeah. It would be very, very helpful. No, it's a very important point, and, and, and we'll, we'll get back to you. Uh, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, sw switching gears a little bit, uh, what, leg uh, what legislation would be most helpful to the NRC uh, to be able to quickly license a DOE-developed Gen 4 reactor? Is w What's out there that we should be doing? To get to that next level. Well, I think the I, I I can't speak in detail for the for the for NRC, but I think that their uh, their appropriated uh, funding is quite uh, modest, I believe, uh, uh, and it's a question of staff uh, to get uh, uh, ed, you know educated, trained in terms of alternative technologies for some technologies like the kind of small the light water based small modular reactors. Uh, it's that's not as big a step away from the current regulatory basis. But if you start going into fast reactors, uh, some of the more exotic uh, 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 molten salt reactors, uh, you put yourself, you put your finger on a very important point. Uh, they need to get staffed up and, uh, and ready to regulate such things. So it would be staff, it would presumably paid for either out of appropriations or out of some uh, way of having the industry uh, uh, support them through, through some fee. Um, I don't. I mean, I, I really don't know in detail, but that's, I presume, the only two sources that are, that are possible. If I could just go back uh, to your opening statement, and because I didn't really see it in your written statement, um, and I tell you, we take so many notes up here, that, but uh, you were mentioning uh, about the energy boom in this country, and uh, would, would you attribute that energy boom especially uh, to the uh, ad advance, advancements we've had in fracking in this country to be able to bring up that natural gas and oil that we have right now? Oh, quite clearly, for gas and, and oil, uh, hydraulic fracturing has been critical. We are still increasing our production in the Gulf of Mexico, but the big increases, certainly in gas, have been from hydraulic fracturing. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My time has expired, and I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back. This time, we recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Tonko, for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Secretary Moniz, thank you for being here this afternoon. And <clears throat> more importantly, thank you for leading the department with such vision and intellect. And uh, your team is great to interact with, so I, I appreciate that. In general, I express my strong support for the research, development, and demonstration funding that is included in the budget request for this year. Innovation is indeed the fuel that will drive progress and create new industries and therefore new jobs. Um, Mr. Secretary, wind and solar technologies are advancing at a rapid and steady pace. I fully support the increase in R&D for these and other renewable technologies. We hear a lot about wind and solar. We hear less about geothermal energy. I see that in the fiscal year 2016 effort, the administration is proposing a significant increase for work in this area, including funding for a research and demonstration site dubbed FORGE. Could you expand, please, a bit on the goals for this funding and on the promise that this technology holds? Well, first, uh, in terms of the promise, uh, uh, engineered geothermal uh, systems, um, uh, hot rock uh, systems, roughly speaking, uh, have um, uh, been looked at as um, having a promise in the United States of perhaps as much as 100 gigawatts uh, of, of, of power. Uh, that came out of a, a 2005 report uh, uh, that the department commissioned, led by MIT, I might say, uh, not by me. Uh, the, uh, but So we're talking certainly many tens to 100 gigawatts is the kind of range of, of potential. Uh, however, uh, the scientific base has not been adequately laid, and that's what the FORGE uh, 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 a project is to do to have a highly instrumented uh, uh, experimental facility uh, that can um, that can better do things like direct control fractures, et cetera, that are a huge part of how you engineer a geothermal system and engineer a geothermal system. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and I'm pleased to see that there uh, is a proposed increase in funding for grid modernization through the Office of Electricity Delivery and Energy Reliability. As you know, the electricity sector is undergoing a significant transformation driven by a number of factors. I believe there is a federal role in helping to uh, smooth out those bumps in the road, so to speak. So um, you mentioned the energy storage and integration work that the department is doing in partnership with Southern California Edison. Uh, the budget proposal includes funds for state energy reliability and the assurance grants. That's a new program. Will these grants be used for projects similar to the one that uh, we've had with Southern California Edison? Well, uh, they certainly could be, but they, they, are, they will be broadly based uh, up into ind individual states to, to, to determine. Uh, they will be planning grants, not project grants, uh, but our hope is that the planning grants will lead to project grants. Uh, for example, uh, in the QER, we will uh, specifically talk about how the state assurance plans that we have proposed uh, could be uh, essentially part of the almost the requirements for then accessing uh, other funds for, for projects. Thank you. There are many aspects um, of the department's portfolio that directly or indirectly address climate change. I'd like to hear a bit more about DOE's proposed work to reduce methane emissions associated with natural gas, gas development and delivery. It's an important uh, emission that needs to be addressed. So uh, is the department, you know, going to explore some new activities here with uh, those admissions? Yes. Um, in particular, um, we, we hosted uh, five um, uh, stakeholder roundtables uh, specifically on, on methane strategy uh, last year. Uh, what I want to note is that our focus at DUE is not so much on the production end, it's on the the midstream, if you like. So the transmission pipes um, uh, and then getting to the distribution systems. Uh, on the transmission pipe in particular, uh, compressors are a big issue. Uh, we are looking at standards for, for, for compressors. And we are also uh, funding uh, new technologies for leak detection, for example. In fact, this morning at RPE, I saw a very, a very elegant one. The RPE, I believe, has supported, has right now 13 methane detection projects uh, going on. Now, are you doing this in partnership with the industry, the, the, the work on the emissions? Well, the, 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 the RPE projects, uh, um, many of them are being done by 
industry, typically small, small, typically small companies, and some some by some by universities. And is it an effort that will require new technology, or is it just taking, uh, uh, making an effort to no, it is, it improve is new, the technology it is, we it is, have? It is it is novel technology to try to get uh, effective, sensitive, inexpensive. Uh, technologies. For example, this morning, the one I saw this morning out at, out at the RPE uh, involved a novel use of carbon nanotubes uh, to, to, to detect methane with high specificity. Okay. Um, I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. This time I recognize the gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. McKinley, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to follow up on the uh, remarks that uh, the uh, congressman from Pennsylvania was talking about with Nettle. Um, and um, I just wanted to get maybe a little bit more specific with us, because just in the next two years, um, Mr. Secretary, uh, when, when you think about the facility in both Morgantown and Pittsburgh, maintaining the level of research, personnel, and all their, their attributes of what they're doing, on a scale of 1 to 10, what do you think it's going to look like two years from now? Be the same? Ten. Well, I think I think in terms of scale, it will probably be very, very, very much the same. Uh, Is it guess. like a ten? You you think that there will be it'll be on the high level that, that we can anticipate that that facility isn't going to change much in the next two years? Again, it's well, it's a it's not going to change in terms of organizational structure. Uh, it's going to I think be very comparable in size, but hopefully. When you look inside, you will see change, of course, as projects evolve. Uh, one of the things that we are doing right now. Okay, uh, I, just, I just I just want is, to get some very okay. We can we can hear. But, but, but the large scale computation at Nettle is being upgraded. Okay, okay thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I noticed the other day that the um, uh, the administration through DOE you had invested in some more projects in carbon capture in China. Uh, is that accurate? I'm not aware of any specific project. No, we in the um, there were clean coal projects there. I think it was carbon capture is what it was. But no, but that I leads could to the be, question. I could be wrong, but I can look into that. But if, if but, it could. but we do have a if I'm in the October agreement of Presidents Obama and Xi, uh, it did say in there something that still remains to be designed that we would work together on a specific sequestration project. Uh, oh, well, instrumented. I, having yeah. said that, though, I, it, it when, when I read that, it tipped off. And where else, if if we're investing money in in, in uh, clean coal to, or whatever uh, energy projects in China, where else are we investing money? Uh, no, outside if, the United. If States? I may clarify, uh, so we have a clean energy research center uh, with 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 China. Uh, it is uh, it's ten million dollars a year that is spent in American laboratories and universities, et cetera. It, it is it, matched by the Chinese, and both of our contributions are matched by industry. Okay, well, that, 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 there's, that's really where I was going to find out. Are we investing in, in bricks and mortar, or are we investing in research? And you're saying it's in research. So if it is in research, will we own the intellectual rights to that uh, based on the research we've done, or, or will it be something shared with the Chinese? Or it, let me la leave it that. Will we own the rights? Uh, the IP issues are very much part of the discussion of every project. Okay, there's so a lot of progress on that. Okay, so now, that we are we are protecting our IP. What about other governments? What other, are we investing in other countries around? Because we seem to have ceded Africa uh, to China, the Chinese uh, in in developing energy. That we, we, okay, first of all, off. we have a very similar uh, matching funds arrangement with uh, with India on some joint projects, including biofuels, etc. Uh, with uh, with Africa, uh, the uh, the main investment again, we we tend to provide a lot of support, but the main investment comes from from uh, AID. I, I, so it's, it's it's Department of State funds. If I could, just two quick. I, I'm I'm afraid I'm going to run out of time. I think that the um, um, everyone has on the other side of the they they've been quick to dodge and talk about there is no war on coal, but there is obviously a war on coal, and, and it I made disagree. people very nervous all around the, <laughs> right. the United States about this. Uh, um, uh, that's why there, you know, these elections have consequences, and you've seen what's happened in some states as a result of it. So I'm just curious because we've got a trade agreement coming up, and I, I have this very strong suspicion that. There is going to be some climate change issues are going to be part of that. Part of that. Can you give me any indication? Have you shared anything with the administration, or have they talked to you about 
what condition, because it's already been telegraphed a little bit, when he went to China and set that deal with China that they could increase their CO2 emissions until 2030, while we were supposed to decrease ours by 15, and then went to India and cut a deal with India that they would use less coal and, and more nuclear. That, to me, was telegraphing that he's going to export his war on coal to other nations. I'm concerned about where the rest of the, what else could happen with the, the various trade agreements that are going to come up are, is, is, do you see any component of fossil fuel, uh, uh, the, the emissions of greenhouse gases or anything else going to be in any trade agreement? I, I certainly don't know uh, that. Uh, I can say that uh, when Ambassador Froman has uh, asked me or us, us for information, it's been mainly on oil and natural gas. Okay, because I, I, I think we ought to be very wary. He's already indicated what what he's done with two other countries and, and to, to, to add the a host of other nations, 19 other nations into it. I, I would be very nervous about supporting any trade agreement as long as there's a potential of cutting back on the use of fossil fuels. Uh, apparently, I've, I'm running out of time. time is going to yell at me here. <laughs> this time, I recognize the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Castro, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. The Obama administration's energy policies are really paying off for American consumers. As the economy recovers and, and uh, more people are working, unemployment is down, to have uh, gas prices at the lowest level in six years is just a great, uh, it's a great thing for so many families and businesses. Mm -hmm. Um, I never thought that I would see gas prices below two dollars again, but I just they have these websites now where you can go and mm -hmm. find the lowest uh, ga the gas station in mm -hmm. your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I just checked back in Tampa. I still found one below two dollars, although most are at two dollars or a little bit more. So the energy information. Uh, 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 group under your purview said that that's going to save consumers, uh, families, seven hundred and fifty dollars a year. So the average household savings. The average household mm -hmm. savings. So that comes at a great time, and it's part of the strategy, part of what we've seen on reduced demand for energy and increased supply. In recent years, the U.S. has experienced a natural gas boom. Uh, now, one of the largest natural gas producers in the world. Uh, and then when you look at uh, savings, the fuel economy is remarkable. Uh, it has improved year after year for vehicles in the U.S. The difference in uh, miles per gallon or your, your fuel economy for between $20, 20 miles per gallon and 30 miles per gallon is $518 per year mm -hmm. for consumers, or about $2,600 over five years. And now consumers have many more choices when it comes to vehicles. We recently purchased a, a new car, and the sky's the limit on how many different kinds of hybrids, electrics. So I think the administration has been right on track. Then when you add in, I saw this report Wind and solar energy have tripled since 2008. The country is changing how it uses energy. The progress, when you sample it, is really impressive. This is a study, the Bloomberg New Energy Finance Report. Progress in clean energy has really been immense. It says wind and solar have achieved liftoff, and the renewable energy story keeps getting better, too. In 2007, according to Bloomberg, uh, and the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, renewable energy provided just 7% of the nation's total, but by 2014, it had nearly doubled to 13%. That's a real success story. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we've seen great improvement in energy efficiency, too. This is the most cost-effective area, but I'm still not convinced that we have unleashed the power of consumers to really conserve energy and use the existing and emerging technology to help them save money and help us all conserve energy. What is in your budget specifically on energy efficiency that will help partner with businesses, the technology companies, and unleash uh, the power of consumers to control their thermostat or for businesses to do better in saving costs? So we uh, we do have uh, in the budget um, a proposed increase for uh, building technologies, uh, and those building technologies can be everything from external skins of buildings uh, and windows to things like smart uh, uh, smart thermostats and smart smart everything uh, uh, there. But I want to emphasize that besides the budgetary 
approach. Let me just mention two other things that, that, that we do uh, to address uh, uh, the, the demand side. One, one is, of course, efficiency standards, uh, uh, setting standards for, for appliances, electric motors, et cetera, uh, and, uh, and, and keeping, keeping at the technology you know, not at, but maybe it's only a little bit behind at least the technology uh, frontier. Uh, that's very important. It, it's it's not appreciated uh, uh, so much that if we take all of the efficiency standards uh, that uh, have come into effect during this administration and those that we project for the next two years, and then we ask for the cumulative impact uh, to 2030, uh, the projection is about $450 billion, that's a B, uh, of energy savings for consumers, uh, and um, about uh, three gigatons of CO2 avoidance. Uh, that's one approach. And then finally, the a third approach besides technology and standards is just convening. So we do something called the Better Buildings Challenge, for example. Um, it's all we do is we convene uh, companies that volunteer to meet a 20% energy intensity reduction by 2020. We give them some branding, uh, and uh, and they agree to share best practices with others. Uh, it's really fantastic. Uh, some companies reach their 2020 goals in like three years and then double down. So it's really so it's it's a broad based approach to it, to efficiency. I'll add that to my list. General Lady's time's expired. This time right now is the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kinzinger, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here and uh, giving us your time and thank you for your service to the country. Uh, I just have a few questions I'm going to get right into. Um, do you believe that the uh, federal government should use a coordinated process? Uh, to assess the impact of policy decisions on national security and uh, foreign policy? Uh, yes, in many ways, that's what the Quadrennial Energy Review is all about, trying to get an integrated, coherent approach. Okay, and would you agree that federal decisions for everything from rulemaking to project reviews and export licenses uh, impact energy diplomacy? <laughs> Well, I would say selectively. I, I, I think we, we need to talk about examples. Okay. Well, I, I believe it's vital that we ensure the United States' role as a leader in the nuclear technology export market uh, that it's maintained. China and India have increased their nuclear generation capabilities 20-fold, and Russia has recently taken the lead in the $500 billion nuclear technology export market. In fact, just yesterday it was announced that Russia and Egypt uh, signed an accord with one another uh, that puts Russia in charge of creating a nuclear plant in Egypt. Let me ask you about the DOE's role in enhancing uh, U.S. manufacturing and competitiveness through your nuclear export control policies. Would you agree that strong nuclear exports will not only contribute to strengthening domestic job growth, but that will also benefit U.S. influence over international uh, nuclear safety and security? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, it's an interesting side note, too, because I think it's for every $1 billion in exports in this, it's something like 10,000 jobs are created, which is, and especially for my district, it's huge, too. With may, may, I just, may, I just, may I just add to reinforce that I think the uh, also, Frank, Frank, the United States, I would say, you know, is the gold standard in terms of nonproliferation norms in energy commerce. So maintaining a strong role in that commerce is very important, and that yeah. would be, too. And I agree with you, and but my concern, though, is as you see, you know, all these other countries, especially Russia, proliferate their nuclear exports. Uh, we may have the gold standard. We may negotiate gold standard agreements, but the Russians don't necessarily have the same standards we do, which is why I think that's so important. Uh, in ensuring peaceful use of civilian nuclear technology is a core mission and responsibility of yours as the Secretary of Energy. What are you doing to ensure that the U.S. is a leader in the peaceful use of civilian nuclear technology? Well, for one thing, I think there's no doubt about it. I think we, have, first of all, advocate uh, for uh, for that uh, and um, help. I mean, we, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we do have quite a bit of nuclear technology being built elsewhere. I mean, in China, for example, uh, there may be like 18 Westinghouse AP-1000s, uh, for example. And just recently in the president's trip to India, there was real progress made in terms of implementing that uh, that uh, that agreement. Uh, and frankly, uh, again, I and others in the administration, when we visit uh, many Eastern European countries, for example, uh, we certainly uh, advocate strongly for the, the, the value of, of U.S.-based technology. And I know many of us do when we do our, our on traveling too. Right. Uh, you've been working on the first revision of the nuclear export procedures uh, 
it would be the first revision in more than 25 years. My only concern is this has been in progress for a little more than three years already. Why is it taking so long for the department to reform its nuclear export procedures? Uh, I think it's fair to say that we will be um, um, uh, we'll be finishing that process very, very shortly. Okay, good. And according to GAO report issued as part of the committee's ongoing nuclear oversight last year, DOE does not have a clear, timely, efficient review process. Uh, some reviews can take more than a year, depriving the U.S. companies from entering into commercial negotiations. Uh, will you uh, commit today that you'll ensure that the department is addressing fully the GAO report recommendations? We uh, will. We have done and will do all that we can to um, to expedite uh, these. I just want to caution that uh, while we are perhaps the signatory in the end, uh, it is a multi-agency review process, and and that can get messy. But uh, I just want to make sure, at least at your level, it's receiving you know senior attention. So hopefully, yes. hopefully that's the case. And then uh, lastly, what's the DOE's plan to ensure that federal agencies continue to use private sector funding and expertise to meet their energy efficiency goals through energy saving performance contracts, or ESPCs? And what's the biggest barrier to increasing the use of ESPCs by the federal government? Well, ESPCs uh, certainly uh, uh, have been very effective, um, and I've be honest, I lost a little track of how many commitments we've. I think we have. I think we're over two billion dollars now in terms of ESPCs, uh, ESPC yeah, contracts. Uh, the uh, one, one of the issues there uh, is, uh, and of course, you know, the president has asked us to double that to four billion dollars, uh, which is going to be a, a real push. Uh, but um, one of the issues is um, that more and more the projects take on a different character than the initial projects. Uh, a lot of the low-hanging fruit, in a certain sense, in terms of direct energy savings, may have been uh, have, have been done. And now it's a question of things like deeper retrofits that have to be done. So so that's, that's a little bit of an issue we're, we're dealing with and going forward. Understood. Thank you. Thank you for being here, and I'll yield back. This time right now, gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I just assume... Uh, we continue with the other Democrats because I think we're going to have votes. <laughs> uh, at this time, the gentleman from Iowa for five minutes, Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I thank the ranking member for um, going out of order. I appreciate that. And thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. I'm very excited to be on the Larger Energy and Commerce Committee and on this subcommittee in particular. Uh, I'm not new to Congress, but I am new to the committee and the subcommittee, and thank you very much again for being here today, and I've really enjoyed the testimony and, and the, the questions from folks from all over the country. Uh, I'm from Iowa. Of course, there's a lot going on on the energy front in Iowa, as you might imagine. Uh, in your testimony, you state that DOE loans and grants have helped to support two commercial-scale cellulosic ethanol facilities. One of these located in my home state of Iowa. And as you know, these are critical for the country going forward. We often talk about corn ethanol. That's first generation ethanol. Cellulosic is second generation. And that seems to get a little more political support nowadays, uh, although I'm still a firm supporter, as you might imagine, of corn ethanol. But what percentage of funds will be set aside for these programs? Or can you elaborate a little bit on what might be set aside for these, these uh, particular second generation ethanol endeavors? Well, there there are a variety of, 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 of approaches. One is, um, and by the way, as a, a, a coming to the committee, if if you would like a briefing, uh, a, broad, a broader briefing on DOE, we'd be happy to arrange Thank that. Thank you, I appreciate uh, for that. You. Uh, the um, uh, like, for example, with the loan program, then uh, there's no specific set aside for biofuels. That would be competing within a broader a broader pool there. Uh, but if you look at some of our direct programs, uh, one of the directions that we are going in now, in addition to the uh, cellulosic uh, uh, ethanol, is moving towards uh, drop-in fuels, uh, because those are, especially the military, uh, is very interested in that. It's a more complex process. Uh, we have, uh, I believe it's 40, something like $45 million uh, in this budget request, specifically for a project with the Department of Defense and the USDA uh, in terms of looking towards, uh, I think, towards three projects for drop-in biofuels. So that's an example of what we're doing. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah, and you mentioned, um, as you did in your testimony, about the investments in biofuels more generally. I don't want to implicate you uh, in the whole renewable fuel standard debate. Thank you. Uh, certainly, that's for another cabinet member probably or two. Um, but with the uncertainty of the blending, gu blending guidelines out there, what does that mean for investments in the biofuels field, if you will? Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I think as in as in all uh, all of the energy technologies, uh, certainly having some uh, uh, some stability and and a clear, clear clear projection, I think is 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 very important. So here, I think uh, one of the issues that remains to be resolved, and you're right, I do not I'm not involved in the RFS, uh, is uh, the question of the vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I mean, is is 10 percent really a blend wall? Uh, uh, what is the future in terms of more flex fuel uh, vehicles? So I, I think we often just focus on the fuel, but it's really the fuel vehicle system I think that we need we need to we need need to address. Not to mention the infrastructure part of it as well. And then comes the infrastructure uh, issue, and that's where, of course, the alternative, uh, for example, biomass derived drop-in fuels right. would resolve that, but at the cost of being being a much more complex process. Exactly. Yeah. Finally. Um, I was one of the lead, leading wind-producing states, as you know, mm -hmm. wind-energy-producing states. About 27% or so of our electricity in Iowa is generated through wind. What kind of investments can we see set aside, if any, for the future as far as the wind industry is concerned? If you could elaborate on that a little bit. Well, the, uh, the, the programs continue to look at um, uh, stretching the technology. For example, uh, uh, the materials for uh, bigger blades, for example, uh, very, is very important. Uh, uh, one, of the, one of the directions there is in the uh, competitively awarded uh, Manufacturing Institute on Composite Materials that we announced in January. That's one, that's one example. Uh, there are, uh, there's work in terms of uh, different um, uh, direct drive, for example, uh, turbines for uh, um, uh, for larger, higher efficiency machines. Mm -hmm. By the way, there's also it's kind of lowbrow, but when you go to the bigger blades, you do have to worry about transportation logistics, uh, and uh, that's that's another issue. And uh, finally, I might just say when you come to Iowa next, just go down Interstate 80, and you'll see lots of those blades being transported across the state. Yeah, we yeah. have TPI composites in Newton in my district. We yeah. have Siemens in Fort yeah. Madison in my district. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's great. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the last thing I'll say is uh, probably uh, it's probably slightly less relevant for Iowa, but uh, we are looking at uh, offshore <laughs> uh, wind as well uh, in terms of uh, trying to capture particularly deep water, uh, a deep water resource. But that'll take a while to get into uh, economically competitive uh, range. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, yeah. Mr. Chair. We have a vote on the floor. There's going to be a, a three votes, and there's about uh, six minutes left in the first vote. Uh, I'm going to go to you, Mr. Griffin, for your five minutes, and then I would ask the other members who have not asked, asked, uh, asked questions, how many of you want to come back? My understanding is the Secretary has a 4 o'clock meeting. He has to leave here at the latest at 345. And, uh, yeah, quarter up, yeah. So how many of you would like to come back to ask questions? Uh, uh, okay. You want to come back, Mr. Flores? We had, we had two or three. Two or three that okay. Well, I tell you what, then uh, we'll go with you, Mr. Griffith, and uh, I guess that would uh, terminate the questions uh, for the secretary, unless you all want to come back. And uh, so, why don't I recognize Mr. Griffith for five minutes? Thank you, uh, um, Mr. Chairman. I do appreciate it, uh, Mr. Secretary. I heard you say something in your opening comments about a trilateral uh, group that met regarding uh, North American energy grid mm -hmm. and indicated that Mexico wanted to hook their grid into our grid. This immediately raised some concerns, which I hope you can allay for me, and that would be that uh, while workers in central Appalachia, and particularly in the 9th District of Virginia, which I happen to represent, are being uh, laid off in the mines because of EPA policy, not DOE policy, but because of EPA policy, we have uh, a situation where if we hook our grid into Mexico's, they could theoretically be sending electricity to the United States made with either Texan coal or Mexican coal or somewhere else they get it. I would note that uh, Texas did approve a project, uh, appears uh, based on the reports that I've got uh, in 2013, 
to send coal. Some, some people claim that it's not as good as coal that we would allow to be burned in the United States, but more importantly, and I'm quoting from an article in, um, if I'm reading this right, heartland.org by Cheryl Chumley, uh, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency restrictions on coal power make Mexico the most viable market for U.S. coal mines near the Mexican border. Mexico has relatively few restrictions on coal power plants relative to the heavy EPA regulations of U.S. coal power plants. And then there's the concern that in the Coahuila, and I hope I pronounced that correctly, region of Mexico, which borders Texas, that the Los Zetas, uh, formerly drug gang, now coal mining gang as well, uh, have taken over the, the coal industry, and they produce about 95% of Mexico's coal. So I just worry if they hook into our grid and then we have a shortage because we have had the EPA debilitate the ability to use coal in this country that will be using coal that's burned at lower standards, lower grade coal, where we have extortion and other things operating in the mines and a safety record for the workers that is abysmal, and I would have to ask you to be cautious on that. And, and I think you would agree with me that you, we may not agree on how much coal ought to be used, but that when coal is used to provide American electricity, it ought to be done under American work standards and under American energy standards, and that we should not be allowing Mexico to backdoor uh, the use of coal, particularly dirty coal, when we have lots of clean coal that my folks would like to be mining and are now finding themselves unemployed. You would agree with that, would you not? With all of our international engagements, trade trade engagements, uh, environmental and labor standards are, are, are critical, yes. And and the problem is, is that if you start wheeling that, that electricity in, it will have been made under their standards. And there's no way you can can uh, well, I, I think, isn't that I, accurate? I, sir, I, I think you, 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 you raise an issue that we need to be on top of. Um, uh, I do think that uh, it's important to recognize, look, then this, this is a, a just an early start of a, of a discussion, uh, but uh, to recognize that uh, Mexico is also taking some pretty strong environmental uh, uh, positions, uh, that's a discussion that, that will have to evolve. I mean, and, and it's, it's a good point. All right, I appreciate that. I will tell you that uh, I think the DOE does some good things. I, I'm worried about the EPA, and I've got a much longer question, but my time is running out because I got diverted with the Mexican issue. <laughs> but it appears that the EPA has asked in their budget request, evaluate, and I'm quoting now, evaluating and capturing these compliance strategies requires the agency to tap into technical and policy expertise not traditionally needed in EPA regulatory development. For example, nuclear, wind, solar, hydroelectric, and demand-side energy efficiency, and to understand and project system-wide approaches and trends in areas such as electricity, transmission, distribution, and storage. I just have to tell you, I often think that the EPA thinks that they don't need Congress. It sounds like from the language in their budget request, they don't think they need the Department of Energy what say you? <laughs> uh, I, I can assure you that uh, we, uh, EPA and other agencies, uh, FERC, uh, others, uh, do call upon us for, for technical analysis. Well, but, but if I, I don't have any problem with them calling on you for technical analysis. It seems like they want to set up their own technical abilities to do that analysis. And don't you think that would be a wasteful spending on our part to approve that for the EPA when we already have your fine agency doing that work? And isn't it just another example of EPA overreach? I appreciate the endorsement of our excellent work. <laughs> and I appreciate uh, uh, you, Mr. Secretary, as well. I have other questions that I'm afraid I'll have to submit for the record because our time is up and that. we do have votes waiting. Thank you. But thank you so much for being here today and thank appreciate you. your good work. Thank you. Ms. Griffith's time has expired. You have something, Mr. We'll submit our questions for the record. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Sir. Mr. Secretary, I've been told that some members did want to come back. Um, it's, I'm sure we won't be back over here until 3.20 or so. Are, are you are you available until 3.45? Yes, if, 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 if we could think of 3.45 as an okay. end date, that would, end time, that would be great. Well, I tell you, if you wouldn't mind just waiting here for a few minutes, I'm going to go to the floor to vote. I'm going to ask the four or five members if they can come back. Okay, if not, I'll call and okay. we'll conclude the hearing. But thank, thank you, and thank, thank you, you for being available. Thank we you. appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, the ter correct term is recess subject to the call.
Let me see if anyone's coming. Yeah, okay. We'll uh, reconvene the hearing, and uh, at this point, I would uh, recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton, to resume his question and answer. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'm more than willing to, but I think Mr. Johnson is ready to go. I'd, I'd let him ask his, and then I'll ask okay. mine. Okay. Oh, Mr. Johnson from Ohio is recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Mr. Secretary, thanks for uh, joining us again. It's always uh, good to see you here. I, I want to, uh, my line of uh, questions deal with uh, LNG exports, and uh, particularly uh, around some of the diplomatic and uh, um, global international implications of uh, uh, America getting into that market in a big way. In, in your opinion, will LNG, U.S. LNG exports improve the efficiency and transparency of international natural gas markets? I think in general, uh, uh, the, more, the more LNG that goes into the global market, the more opportunity there is for a market development. Okay. Um, so I take that's a yes in terms of efficiency and transparency. That you think? Yeah, all I mean is it's the whole LNG global market. Right. Okay. Um, do the EIA 2012 LNG export analysis and the 2014 update, uh, the NERA economic uh, consulting analysis and the NETL analysis, all commissioned by DOE, does that give DOE the sufficient data needed to make the public interest determination about LNG exports? Uh, last year, when we uh, modified the process, uh, we said that we do have that set of that set of analyses uh, for up to 12 BCF per day. Uh, we're currently at 5.7, so we're still quite a, quite some headroom uh, there. Uh, but we said we would need to con uh, to commission, and we have done so, new analyses for going from 12 to 20. Should that be called upon, we are still awaiting uh, the contracted uh, second study. Okay. Um, when do you expect the Cove Point terminal to receive its final DOE approval? I believe Cove Point has received its final approval. Uh, I'm, um, I'm not, anybody... Anybody know? I think I thought we had. Well, 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 I'll check. Well, maybe we can mutually uh, okay. verify. We'll we'll verify. We'll verify either way. And uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, but uh, but I do. I would emphasize that the. Um, uh, I mean, we have no no applications available right now for our final act. Well, it, it was our understanding that uh, uh, that what I was expecting uh, was that you were waiting for FERC to reject their opponent's request for rehearing. Uh, but FERC is not under a time limit, uh, therefore they're waiting. So the, the question is, uh, are, are, is there a, are we waiting for FERC to, to do a rehearing? Does anybody know? Again, I may be getting confused, but I, I thought we had approved uh, Cove Point and, uh, sorry? Conditional? Oh. We had no, okay, I'm sorry, you're correct, apparently, that we do not have a final approval. We are waiting for the EIS then from, from FERC. Well, uh, so FERC does not have a time limit for their rehearing. Is, is there a policy requirement that DOE wait for FERC to deny the request for rehearing, or is it just DOE practice? Because uh, I liked your first answer. I, I, <laughs> I, I wanted no, approved. Uh, the... Um, uh, so we need to have the EIS um, uh, in order to, to have the information on environmental impact for the public interest determination. Is that, is that what would come out of the rehearing process? If, if FERC is having a rehearing, that's what would come well, out. Well, that, that's the problem. Yeah. FERC is not under a timeline to do a rehearing, so it just sits there. Well, okay. Look, I, I will go go look into the status of that uh, that specific. Could you please? Yes, yeah. I will. And uh, and uh, it's just that again, we need to have the adequate information for the for our making a public interest determination because we have we decided long ago, the department before I was the department that you know we certainly didn't want to do a parallel uh, environmental impact statement. Sure. So typically, what we simply do is adopt the FERC statement. Okay. 
Yeah. Uh, shifting gears just a little bit, I, I want to commend you personally uh, uh, for including the $100 million in the FY16 budget for the continued domestic uranium enrichment research and uh, development and demonstration activities in Piketon, Ohio. Um, this is a critical domestic uh, need, national security. We've talked about that to produce our own uh, enriched uranium. Um, the uh, uh, the FY15 Cromnibus contain language that directs the DOE to report to Congress by April 30th of this year with an accounting on the current and future availability of low enriched uranium uh, to meet our national security needs. Can you give us a uh, status report on uh, that report, and will the department meet the 30 April? Deadline. There, there is there's a very active uh, multi-agency process going on right now with the, with the the aim to meet that target. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Much time has expired. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Yarmouth, for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for being here. Uh, I just want to begin by applauding your willingness to bring um, a, a demonstration uh, to of uh, uh, research to the committees. Um, one of the things that obsesses me now is to <clears throat> try to figure out how we can make policy when things in the world are changing so rapidly. And we were talking earlier about the the, uh, the grid, and I read somewhere not too long ago where somebody's invented a way to transmit energy through sound waves, electricity through sound waves. And I'm thinking, if that's something that is <clears throat> actually viable and scalable, then we might have a whole different alternative to the grid. So. Uh, the things that, uh, as a matter of fact, I thought it'd be good for us to just keep have bringing futurists to the committee to talk so we have, make decisions in context. But so anyway, I appreciate that and look forward to it. Uh, one of the things that uh, I've been so excited about in the energy field is that the, the federally funded um, clean en energy manufacturing initiatives have made a huge difference in, around the country and specifically in my district. We have, uh, because of the federal initiatives, we have like 4,000 new jobs at Ford, uh, Ford Motor Company Manufacturing Plant. We have several thousand new jobs at a GE appliance plant because they are producing now energy efficient appliances that have benefited from federal tax, tax credits. Uh, they brought a line of uh, hybrid water heaters back from China, 420 jobs. So these types of programs can have a, a phenomenal um, <clears throat> benefit for the community. Could you talk about the initiatives going forward, what you're proposing in the budget to continue that kind of initiatives to promote energy efficient um, manufacturing? Well, um, there are many things. Uh, 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 for one thing, among the, for the uh, Manufacturing Institute initiative, uh, we are proposing to have full funding of two new institutes in the FY16 budget. Uh, that would be very, uh, very, uh, very exciting. Those are competitively awarded, and uh, um, and and typically. Uh, in in the competition so far, the states have stepped up very very strongly uh, in terms of matching those those funds. So that's that's one very important initiative. Uh, the uh, and by the way, we to go back to some earlier dis uh, discussions with those uh, institutes, we are also making sure we integrate training programs uh, with them so that uh, you know you can get a workforce in the area, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, on things like the. Um, the Ford plant you mentioned, uh, I believe, was part of the uh, loan program in the ATVM. Uh, we still have $16 billion of authority left in that program, uh, and uh, we are encouraging especially uh, suppliers uh, uh, for, the, for the auto industry to come forward. Uh, and uh, uh, we also have, of course, calls out for fossil, uh, renewables and efficiency, and nuclear, and when you put those all together, uh, those could really, uh, really help help move the needle. I think, uh, as have the previous loans, uh, uh, in terms of jobs and cutting edge manufacturing. There is this one thing that uh, I've been meaning to ask somebody. So you're a good person to ask. Uh, several months ago, well, it's probably a year ago now, uh, General Wesley Clark was speaking to a group that I was part of, and talking about. He's been doing a lot of work in the energy field internationally and been traveling back and forth to China. And one of the things he was concerned about was he talked about a company in Washington state that had, that had actually developed a process for baking coal, not for energy, but 
to get very valuable minerals, been able to do that. And they were looking for some venture capital, I think it was $75 million, and couldn't find it. Um, so ultimately, a Chinese company came in and bought the technology that had been developed in, in uh, the United States. Is, the, is, this the ty is that the type of situation that uh, that loan program or other, maybe uh, some other DOE initiatives might be able to uh, accommodate? I would have to see, see it in more detail. I, I, from what the sound of it, I don't think the loan program would do that. The loan program needs to push, push the technology envelope in a uh, in a, in emissions emissions re reducing uh, uh, technologies. Uh, now I don't know what the minerals are. For example, earlier we mentioned uh, that there is a study going on right now that uh, should be ready two three months. I would guess uh, on the question of whether or not coal or the coal combustion products are a viable source of rare earth minerals. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that, uh, if it looks positive, then we'll come back and work with the Congress to see about a program there. Great. Thank you very much. I yield back. This time right now is a gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. And thank you, Mr. Secretary. We appreciate your uh, access to the subcommittee and the full committee. You've always been one of the most accessible uh, Obama administration, administration officials, and it is appreciated sincerely. I want to ask about the um, situation in the world of oil markets. Uh, as you know, um, not too many months ago, the price of oil was over $100 a barrel. Now it's below 50. Um, uh, massive layoffs in the uh, uh, service industry in the oil patch and uh, drilling programs. I talked to an independent producer and in Texas this past week, they had 15 rigs operating a year ago. They have two today, and they're not completing the wells. They're just drilling them, and then they're not fracking them. They're just drilling the wells. Um, I introduced H.R. 702 last week to repeal the existing ban on crude oil exports. Um, I have heard you and other venues say reasonably positive things about that. Uh, I would like... Uh, your position and the department's position, and if you're able to give it, the administration's position, uh, if y'all would support uh, the outright repeal of the existing ban on crude oil. Uh, my bill also requires a study of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. To, you know, we've got a, a fairly large SPR these days, uh, and, and so we, we want to repeal the ban and then uh, take a look at what the future is for the SPR. I'd encourage your comments on those two issues. Well, um, um, Mr. Barton, as you know, the uh, the crude export policy issue is one for the, the Department of Commerce uh, to, uh, to address. They did issue this clarification uh, recently about uh, 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 lightly processed condensates, uh, and uh, and I think provided some. Well, they're granting permits on a case by case basis, which is appreciated, but but that's not a substitute, in my opinion, for a, a, a comprehensive policy, and it, it's much more cumbersome, it takes a lot longer, and it's not universal, as you well know. Yeah, so uh, the, uh, that's, again, that's an issue that at the policy level uh, Department of Commerce uh, would, would address. Um, uh, I, I do always put in context uh, that uh, we do still import 7 million barrels of oil uh, per day, and I think that is uh, uh, an issue. That plus, of course, current low prices uh, can, uh, would severely impact, I think, what actually you know, would be the ground truth, but um, uh, but uh, obviously uh, we have had some analyses done. EIA, for example, has uh, published uh, a uh, a piece that says the uh, uh, exports would probably have zero or a small negative effect on gasoline prices, for example, right. um, uh, be, mainly because the Brent price tends to correlate with our product prices. So th so we will continue to do analysis uh, that, that supports a well, I would decision. I would assume, I know the Department of Commerce has to make these decisions, but I would assume if the president were thinking about making a change in law, since it's oil export, crude oil exports, he would consult with the Secretary of Energy. And you happen to be the Secretary of Energy. <laughs> if the Secretary of Commerce were here, I would ask his position, but he's not here. Her, her. Uh, and, 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 and you are. I would also point out that uh, uh, 
uh, we export about four million barrels per day of refined products, yes. which is up considerably. So you, we've got a situation right. where the patient's half pregnant, where uh, we're exporting the refined products but not allowing the crude, and it does give our refiners somewhat of a captive market for the uh, domestic uh, crude oil. And if we if we just went mm -hmm. free market totally, I think yeah. everybody would be better off. Obviously, it would squeeze the profit margin of the refiners because they would not be able to maintain that captured discount, which has fallen. It's been over $25 a barrel, but right now it's, I think, around $5 a barrel. So as the world prices come down, that mm -hmm. that discount that the domestic refiners are receiving is, 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 is coming down, too. Uh, in my last 37 seconds, um, Future Gen, um, the department, I think, made the correct decision, uh, sadly, not too long ago, to uh, stop funding that project. Oh, God. Uh, what's your position on the next uh, step in terms of uh, uh, clean coal technology, uh, carbon capture sequestration, or perhaps even carbon capture and conversion? Uh, well, first of all, I want to uh, agree with your characterization that it was sadly because uh, getting a oxy combustion uh, plant uh, done would be a good, a very good demonstration. Uh, but the ARA funding deadline just made it uh, uh, not viable. Uh, we remain very committed to that. We still have a bunch of projects coming, including in Texas, the uh, Petronova project, for example, coming on is the Summit project. Um, uh, the um, and also the industrial facilities, the Air Products. Project, for example, also in in, in Houston, mm -hmm. is, is is operating. Uh, so we're going to keep pushing forward. Uh, and two things, looking forward, in addition to our research on you know new capture technologies, etc. Uh, two issues going forward. Uh, 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 one is we do have the the active solicitation for eight billion dollars of loan guarantee uh, for fossil projects with. Uh, emissions reductions, uh, and we have a, I can't talk about specifics, but God. we do have a very encouraging proposal stream. And secondly, in the FY16 budget, uh, not from DOE, but from Treasury, is the tax credit uh, proposal uh, for CCS. Okay. So a $2 billion, $2 billion ITC for construction, including, including in CO2 infrastructure, and a sequestration so you're still supportive of research into the technology, bottom line? Both research and deployment uh, mm -hmm. uh, encouragement. We have four members still who would like to ask questions. I'm going to ask each of you to cut it to three minutes if possible because the, I know the Secretary is leaving. You all tell me when he has to go to get to his White House meeting, but Mr. Sarbanes, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, thank you for being here, Mr. Secretary. Um, could you just maybe give me one minute of my three minutes speaking to what you see as the benefits that are already being realized from the efforts and the heroic efforts of the Department of Energy over the last few years to just generally diversify the energy portfolio um, of the country? I have an impression that the, the, the falling gas prices in part can be linked to that general commitment to diversification um, because of the concerns and anxiety it produces um, overseas from OPEC and others. But if you could speak to that briefly and any other broad benefits you see from the diversification um, effort, which I think has been uh, uh, really terrific over the last few years. Well, first of all, the diversification effort would go forward uh, irrespective of where the oil price was going because this is a long-term, long-term investment, uh, number one. Number two, very critical, and I would refer you to a little paper on our website called Revolution Now uh, that shows, I think, the big story. If for four technologies, including solar and, and LEDs, uh, vehicle batteries, it shows the tremendous cost reduction uh, of those technologies going forward and the associated large deployment increase. That's the huge story, and that's, in the end, key to what we do, trying to push the envelope and get the cost down for these, for these right. technologies. Let me, let me switch gears to another topic, which increasingly, according to all the surveys that are coming back in, in, um, in the recent period, the, the uh, American public is now very focused on the effects of climate change and it appears with each passing day more and more convinced that uh, we need to step up and address this in a sustained uh, fashion and I think that's that's right and um, in your testimony you talk about 
um, the sequestration of over 9 million metric tons of CO2 through DOE-supported projects. You talk about the efficiency standards that have been um, issued in, in calendar year 2014 and what that will mean um, between now and 2030, that since 2009, you're projecting that um, you'll have a 2.2 billion metric ton of carbon emission reduction up through 2030. Just speak to how these efforts the Department of Energy has undertaken can leverage even more meaningful steps more broadly out there in the country to meet the challenge that we have in terms of addressing climate change. Well, first of all, uh, uh, for, that, for that example, I mean, efficiency is the number one uh, uh, short payback, uh, typically, uh, approach. And what this pr approach does, I mean, we do have, we support the R&D to develop technologies. But in this case, with appliances, et cetera, it's more we put out a well-understood uh, standard, cost-benefit analysis, and our companies uh, uh, are plenty innovative enough uh, to meet and beat those standards. Great. Thank you very much. Inspired. Mr. Long, it's right now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. Uh, what do you attribute these precipitous drop in gasoline prices to? What, you, what do you think are the main couple of factors that have led to this big drop in gas prices? Well, I think the main the main issue is uh, the combination of uh, production, especially U.S. production. U.S. production of oil went up 1.6 million barrels per day uh, just last year. Uh, due to what? Uh, due to the technology that had been developed uh, over over the years in terms of hydraulic fracturing and uh, horizontal drilling, uh, opening up the shale the shale plays, also some deep water, but the shale plays uh, mainly. Uh, so we had a very, very strong production. Uh, we've produced an extra m several million barrels per day at the same time that you have economic softness, for example, in, uh, in Europe uh, and, uh, and a lot of slowed growth in, in the Far East as well. Yeah, so the I'd, supply demand. Yeah, supply and demand. I mean, to me, common sense dictates, tells me that that's, uh, but I'm not, don't have your knowledge, I'm not in your position, but when we talk about fracking and things, and there was a gentle lady on the other side of the aisle that spoke earlier uh, that was very happy that gas prices have dropped so precipitously, which we're all thrilled. I first time I went home after the big drop, I filled up. I thought the pump had stopped. It was <laughs> like thirty dollars short of where it used to ring up, and uh, we're all pleased with that. But uh, I think that fracking has been very effective in produce in increasing the amount of production in this country. And I just wanted to make sure that I was on the right uh, wavelength with that. Uh, you also, uh, and to your credit, pointed out when uh, Mr. Olson from Texas was talking about the carbon sequestration plant down there, and you corrected him and said, it's not running. Uh, we've had hearings before where they're not running. Do we have any that are up and running? And if so, why not? And are they going to be viable? Because everyone brags about carbon sequestration, which would be a great thing, but I haven't found any that are operating. You see these projections of when they're going to be online in 15 and 17 and 19 and where are we on that? Well, again, uh, there are uh, there are plants operating. Uh, uh, there's a uh, uh, a natural gas uh, reforming facility in Texas uh, uh, that is that is operating, uh, putting carbon underground. Uh, I might add, in again, the uh, in terms of an integrated coal plant, uh, the Boundary Dam uh, uh, plant in uh, in Canada uh, is f fully operational. And the one in uh, Texas that he was referring to. Then when the, you think it, the, the it Petra, Petra Nova is right. uh, is under construction. Uh, it, in, it'll be a few years until it's until it's fully operating. Uh, the Kemper plant in Mississippi is nearing end of end of construction. Uh, the uh, ADM uh, ethanol plant capturing CO2 is nearing completion in Illinois. So we have a lot. And by the way, we've also had from the Great Plains plant in North Dakota, its gasification facility, it has supplied 20 megatons of CO2 for enhanced oil recovery in Canada. So the, there's a lot of, lot of activity going on. Uh, so we can look forward to the keystone being complete when we get that down here. Thank you. 
Mr. Engel, you recognize three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to thank you, Mr. Secretary, for waiting. I'm going to try to condense everything into three minutes. I want to first be on the record in supporting flex fuel cars. I don't understand why every car built in America isn't flex fuel. I'm told you can do it for under $100 a car, and I think we should be doing it. Um, I want to tell you that I appreciate the President's budget. It makes a strong commitment to clean energy. I think it's important. Climate change is real. Um, there's already enough CO2 in the atmosphere to ensure that the U.S. will have more episodes of climate disruption. Superstorm Sandy in my district in New York, Hurricane Katrina, snow in Boston and Buffalo. Um, we, need, we really need to, to take actions. Um, I've had many uh, long conversations with Con Edison in New York about improvements they can make to better protect their critical energy infrastructure. And I know that the Department of Energy also made recommendations for industry and governments to enhance response preparedness, restoration, and resilience to future storms. So can you provide me with an update on DOE's efforts to implement its recommendations, including updates on the progress and timing of the Northeast Gas Reserve? How has communications been improved? What has been done to facilitate access to fuel and other supplies? And have you identified any existing laws that need to be amended or laws that need to be promulgated? Uh, that's my first question question. My, se my second question involves uh, Indian Point. I have been opposed. Uh, I, have, I have been foreclosing Indian Point. Um, it's uh, just north of New York City. Um, I'm convinced it would never be approved uh, at its current location if it would be built today for a myriad of reasons. And um, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, your predecessor, Dr. Chu, expressed the need to look at whether the Indian Point reactors should remain. And I'm wondering if you could uh, commit to do the same. Well, on the first question, um, uh, first of all, more broadly in terms of emergency response, uh, the, the Northeast uh, situation uh, is clearly a major one in terms of uh, climate. I just want to note that other examples would include, for example, the propane issues last, last year in the upper Midwest. Uh, and in all these cases, uh, we are, first of all, we are greatly increasing uh, through the EIA. Uh, the EIA is, by the way, a really important agency. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, our database and our communication with state energy offices so that we have good situational awareness.